Hello and welcome to this Women in Ag Wednesday webinar. Sorry I couldn't attend today. I'm at a conference and hopefully if you have any questions over the content we're going to talk about today, you guys can um, email me and I'll get back with you. But bear in mind, I'm at the conference. Um, you're watching this on a Wednesday. I don't get back in the office till Friday and maybe next Monday before I can get back with you. But I will get back with um, any of your questions you might have. Um, but my name is Paul Geringer. I'm the Extension Legal Specialist here in the Department of Ag and Resource Economics. And I work with the Ag Law Education Initiative that I'm going to talk about here in a minute. But um, I was asked today to do one over um, understanding and managing pesticide drift liability. If any of you went to the Women in Ag Conference um, in Delaware last month, no, it's almost two months ago, um, I did this similar presentation to this there. Um, there'll be no heckling at this one if you were there. Um, in that one, but, um, well, you can heckle me from your computer, but, you know, I'm not going to be able to hear you today because this is a recording. Um, but today we're going to talk about this because this is a growing area in ag. It's not, it's always been around, but it's become more in the news here lately. So to give a little bit of background, um, I am with the Ag Law Education Initiative. Um, this is a collaboration of the Carey School of Law at the University of Maryland, Baltimore, the College of Ag and Natural Resources at the University of Maryland, and UMES on the Eastern Shore. Um, we're funded by the University of Empowering the States um, project, and we are um, an extension program that's located, um, one of the only extension programs that's funded by this. Um, we have a separate website at umaglaw.org. And social media, you can find us there. My email will be at the end um, if you need to get me, but that's an email, a generic email where you can reach almost all of us. We have specialists on all three campuses. I'm going to skip the empowering the state thing um, real quickly just for time. Um, as a part of with the department, I run the Maryland Risk Management Education blog. Um, you can find information there at agris.umd.edu. Um, we talk about crop insurance, which is another project I'm a part of, farm policy, water conservation, and timely legal issues. Um, and then if you like the sound of my voice, I'm actually recording this the same way I record most of my podcasts, sitting at my dining room table with a microphone in front of me, drinking um, a cup of tea as I do this. Um, but you can find that at MarylandAgPodcast.org. The site will have changed. Um, I did not update this today. I'm doing away with the standalone website and moving it more towards the hosting site that was already hosting it. But I'm keeping the URL to help keep people there. But you can find that on anywhere where you find um, podcasts at. And I cover a lot of the same issues on the, that I cover on the blog. Um, Again, for those of you that heard me speak before, and luckily we're recording this today, this is not legal advice today. I'm glad we're all good with that. There's no real way to eliminate all the legal risk. I hope you were paying attention to during that. And I'm just impressed that hopefully while you're watching this on the screen and WebEx, my GIFs still work during all of this. So to kind of give you a little bit of overview of this, how many of you have had concerns in the past years you've seen the news, especially as it relates to, as my picture showed, dicamba, that pesticide drift could potentially be out there, you could potentially get damaged, or if you're spraying dicamba, I, many of you will potentially be spraying um, dicamba-resistant beans this year, um, more of you than did last year, and there's potential that you could be hit with liability or you're just spraying dicamba for normal um, pasture control and other things and potentially are now concerned about this, but this has always been an issue in ag. It became more prevalent and more in the news as we saw dicamba resistant crops enter the market, specifically dicamba resistant cotton and soybeans, the two that really needed to be resistant to this before they could go on the market. Um, USDA approved for commercial planting Monsanto's new varieties in 2016, and this just to give a little bit of background. Both of these varieties were dicamba resistant. I also can't say that word, um, but they were not resistant to the types of dicamba on the market. That's not actually correct. I sh need to rework that slide, but the actual way to say that is they are resistant. Those dicambas on the market currently when these came on the market in 2016 were not labeled for in-crop use. So we had to get lower, um, lower, less drift dicambas that are labeled for in-use in um, drift. Um, in fact, when they were put out on the market, Monsanto warned growers not to spray the dicamba. Um, the reason the dicamba seeds came on the market first is because 
USDA approved them faster than EPA approved the new herbicides. So this was an issue where technologies did not exactly line up when they came on the market. To kind of continue the timeline, many growers didn't listen to this. There's also evidence that Monsanto actually told them they could potentially spray these dicambas with no problem. There's also just the issue that many of these growers are in the south and dealing with um, dicamba or Roundup resistant pigweed and other weeds and needed something to be able to t clean up fields and they sprayed it anyway. Um, the drift issues were reported from Minnesota down through most of the south. As my gift points out, it really was like dogs and cats living together. It was just mass pandemonium. EPA approved that new di those new dicambas in early November of 2016. It was shortly after the presidential election. So what penalties at the time did producers face? Well, at the time, there potentially were just violations for not following the label. We had 271 complaints filed, and this was just in Arkansas, Missouri, and Tennessee. Um, at the time, most of those states fined up to $1,000 per violation. After this, in 2016, we saw a lot of plant boards move this fine up. Arkansas increased it to $25,000 per violation. So let's go back to let's go ahead the next growing season 2017. Um, this slide um, was created by Kelly Knuckles, who works with me here um, in the department and with the Ag Law Education Initiative. But this is a site that Kevin Bradley, who's a weed scientist at the University of Missouri, put together, and he shows the dicamba damage that was reported. And basically, this was either reported to the state, if I remember correctly or just visual that, you know, weed specialists had saw across the state. Anywhere in yellow, there was at least some damage potentially reported. In all, there were 2,242 claims, with the bulk of those being in Arkansas, Tennessee, and Missouri. As a part of this as well, we still had damage. We saw a host of lawsuits filed, class action lawsuits, these were just the ones that came up at one time. They have all now been consolidated down into one lawsuit that's out of the Eastern District of Missouri. I can't ask this question because none of you are currently in the room with me and this is a recording, but why does it need to be in the Eastern District of Missouri? The Eastern District of Missouri's um, court is located in St. Louis, Missouri, i.e. the home of Monsanto. So Monsanto did not want these to be consolidated, but if they were consolidated, they did want them consolidated in their home turf of the Eastern District of Missouri. There have been other lawsuits. I don't think I've updated the slides to reflect the fact that Arkansas has put a ban on all in-crop use of dicamba, in-season use of dicamba, um, and there have been lawsuits filed against that. Um, currently, only six farmers in the state of Arkansas are allowed to spray dicamba. I'm still waiting to see the ruling on that from the state court to kind of figure out why the, only those six are allowed to spray it. It's not the most confusing, uh, not the most clear issue when you read the news reports. I'd kind of like to read the case to kind of get a better sense of what the, what the, the attorneys um, argued in that case. Um, BASF at the same time had data that showed most of the damage in 2017 was sprayed by off-label, um, older dicambas being sprayed off-label. Why might growers be spraying dicamba off-label, off the older varieties? It's cheaper than the newer varieties, and if prices are low and t margins are tight, you're potentially always going to look at the generic in this case um, to do it, and that's potentially going to drift. There's also points in the class action lawsuits where Monsanto may have not been truthful in how, um, you know, volatile this stuff may have been in the environment, the new dicambus. It's not entirely clear what exactly the issue is here. That's something that will be play out in court potentially to get to it. Um, so EPA regulations, the older versions of dicamba, Banville, Clarity, those that you've heard about before, those are not allowed to be used in crop or over crop during the growing season. These new dicambas, as I've talked about, are labeled for this. Um, currently, based on the new ones, you have to be a certified applicator to put this on. 
you have to receive a specific training and um, those trainings were done this summer or not this summer this winter and I think many of the counties did those you can't spray in winds faster than 10 miles an hour you have new record keeping requirements you have to do this during the daylight um, there's very specific tank clean out requirements there were issues as potentially tanks were not being cleaned out well enough and you're now required to check for sensitive crops before spraying the hope being that most states with sensitive crop indicators will have sensitive crops in them that's not always the case um, in all states 2017 requirements that remain you cannot apply if rain is expected in the next 24 hours you cannot make in-crop application after beginning bloom. Equipment must be low, slower than 15 miles an hour. Um, it says wind less than three, but I believe that changed with the um, other label requirement. You must survey all non-target susceptible crops before spraying, and you need to include a buffer of between 210 and 220 feet, depending on how many ounces are being sprayed. There are other requirements as well. You should always check the label. This is one of the most fluid labels EPA has ever approved. If things do not go well during the 2018 growing season, expect the label to change again or the product to be potentially no longer on the market. We have had one deadly altercation over this. We have one, one person shot in the Boot Hill area of Missouri. Um, by a neighbor and this was drift that had happened year after year this was just not one incident this was multiple years of incidents so where are we going to go with our remaining about a time and I haven't been taking good track of my time so I'm hoping I'm still doing well in my time and I don't currently have a timer up so this is not going to go well for all of us I bet but we're going to look at Maryland cases there are none there are none involving drift liability if you know one, email me. Let me know. I mean, even if it was settled out of court where nobody took sides, I'm kind of curious. Other states have these decisions, but there's really no uniformity. Um, there's potential liability either based on negligence or not following the label, and we're going to talk about that at the end. Not following the label is almost always the way you're going to have liability found against you. Then we're going to discuss what to do if you're hit with this drift issue kind of what should you be doing the issue when i talk about the lack of uniformity these various state court decisions give us over you know any state but maryland and it's pretty much limited to a few states it makes it harder to kind of give you tips on how to manage your liability in this if this was an ag leasing case i could kind of talk to you because there's a history of cases drift liability is a lot harder there's not that history there but before we kind of talk about this, we need to talk about what the idea of negligence is. Negligence is simply the failure to exercise a duty of care we would expect under the circumstances. We expect everyone in the world to follow a certain duty of care when they're acting in a certain way. If you have an agritourism operation, when people come on, you know, you typically expect them to act the way you would expect a normal customer to act, not run, not be unruly act a certain way and if they get out and get hurt they potentially you know have breached this duty of care we expect or if you don't keep the area safe we would normally expect you know a business owner to keep an area where customers are going to be up to a certain quality if you don't do that you breach a duty of care but we all expect this every day in our lives we all live up to this duty you don't know you're living up to it until you actually screw up and you don't. And how we show this is we show how normal people would act under the circumstance, and we let a jury decide. So the drift case is where we have drift as negligence. Looking at negligence, we have to show four elements. We have to show the defendant, the person who caused the injury, owed a duty of care to act reasonable under the circumstances to the plaintiff or the injured party. After that, we have to show that the defendant the person who did the injury breached that duty of care. We have to show next that the breach was approximate cause of that injury. And then finally, we have to show actual damages. You have to prove all of these. If you don't prove all of them, you don't have a case. With drift cases, our problem is almost always a breach and sometimes it's proximate cause. Most of the time, we don't even get past breach because it's very hard to show breach. And I'll talk about why that is here in a second with a case as an example. So when we look at a case, we have this case out of Arkansas. I like this case. It's very clear. 
We have mangrum um, where neighbor's corn crop was damaged due to Roundup Ultra. The farmer and the pilot, the farmer whose field was being sprayed by the pilot, this was an aerial application, were sued for negligence. When the court looked at this, they found no nev evidence of negligence to show the pilot or the farmer did anything wrong. Why, the only witness was the pilot who took all the precautions. His record showed he took all the precautions. He said he took all the precautions. As I often point out with this, if you're the only witness to the thing and you're the person who did it, how likely are you to tell the truth that you screwed up? This is not to call this pilot a liar. I am not doing that. I am pointing out what human nature could potentially be. I have no doubt he followed every rule. But human nature could potentially be that he did not take all the precautions. There were no other witnesses that saw this. They did not see the drift take place. Courts really want to see a witness to this and have someone who witnessed a drift take place. Roundup Ultra is a very common herbicide. If you're spraying a common herbicide and everyone around you is spraying the same herbicide, how do we know when that damage specifically was you? It's going to be a little bit harder to prove at times. Um, Roundup Ultra is a little easier to do this with. Dicamba is a little harder because it could be miles away where the drift happened and then there was volatilization. I'm over-exaggerating on that, but it's potentially a little bit harder to show um, who this was and who it could be. And looking at weather reports and everything from that day, it took place under safe conditions. The weather was perfect for it. There should have been no issue. What could have happened differently? The sprayer did not take safety precautions um, when doing this. There were witnesses to see the drought, drift, and there's a less common chemical use. If we could show some of that, that's potentially going to bolster the case. That's really hard to do in these cases because we're dealing with a lot of farmers using the same chemicals. With negligence, there's this other idea. It's this idea of rips ipsa loquitur. Rips ipsa loquitur is Latin for the thing speaks for itself. It's this doctrine that provides in some circumstances a mere fact that the accident occurs is an inference enough that we can show negligence and establish the case. These are rare cases when we actually apply this doctrine. We're going to talk about the first case that was ever applied and then we'll talk about it in the context of drift liability. It's a two-part test. The character of the incident is such that it would not ordinarily occur in the absence of negligence, and we'll talk about that here in a second. I have an example that will help all of these make sense. The instrumentality causing the injury is shown to have been under the management or control of the defendant. We only have cases out of Texas on this. Texas courts have applied this doctrine more than anybody else. I mean, no other state, from what I could tell, had ever done this. Texas case, one Texas court found this case to apply in an aerial application. And before I get into this, let me back up a slide. Let me give an example of all this before we get into this to make it a little easier. I apparently deleted the slide I thought was there. Um, so the classic case of this is a man is walking down the street. All of a sudden he passes an open window, second or third story window, and a flower barrel falls and hits him in the head. Um, company that it fell out of the window is a company that makes flour, you know, produces flour, puts it in barrels. We don't do this anymore. Think of this about, you know, 150, 200 years ago at the time when this incident did happen. Do flour barrels normally fall out of the sky for no reason or out of windows for no reason? Not usually. It's not usually a common occurrence. Think of anything big falling out of a window. Would it normally fall out of the window without negligence? Not really, so it's probably, you probably meet, you know, number one. Is the instrumentality that caused the injury here, the flower barrel, um, shown to have been under the management and control of the defendant? Well, if we show it fell out of their window, as we could in the case of the flower barrel, yeah, we can show it's under their management and control. That is a real case. It did happen to a man. It was the first time this doctrine was ever applied. Um, since then, courts have wrestled with this, and we can see it out of these Texas cases. I kind of went to first and then realized I needed to give my example. But looking at this, the Texas court found it applied in an aerial application when the discharge of the chemical was sudden. It was unexpected and could only have happened through negligence some way in the equipment. 
What happened was the pilot was flying along. All of a sudden, for some reason, the plane dropped the chemical. The plane just allowed the chemical to come out. He did nothing to do this. There was, he didn't hit a button. He didn't do anything. The chemical just came out of the plane on its own. There, he freely admitted this happened in court. That equipment was under the control of the defendant, i.e. the pilot in this case. Yeah, so it's 100%. It's a plane. It's not under anybody else's control. It's under the defendant's control, the pilot. So that was. In this case, the farmer and the pilot were both sued for this injury. Um, the farmer was also liable because he was, you know, he employed this aerial applicator. So in both this case, both aerial applicators were um, defendant were negligent. The court also, the Texas court again looked at this years later and said, yeah, not every aerial application case is going to end in nuisance where there's drift. Um, there was no evidence here that the equipment just failed. Everything was working properly. The pilot took all the precautions. Again, the witnesses, common use pesticide here, one used to control boll weevils in cotton production. And again, the application was made under safe conditions. They went back and checked the weather reports. They could tell everything at the time the application was said to have taken place took place under perfect conditions. So it's unclear who caused the drift damage in this. It may have been this person who was sued, but we don't know. And that's the problem. If we can't really tell who was at fault, that's why courts really want to see this drift cloud. We're making somebody pay for damage. We really want to make sure they're the person that's at fault. And if we don't have that witness, it's really hard. The final idea in negligence I want to talk about is this idea of strict liability. Strict liability, we don't care how safe you make something. If something goes wrong, you're negligent for and liable for the damage. I use the example of the tiger. You know, if you own a tiger or any other dangerous animal and it gets out, it doesn't matter how safe you made the cage or what precautions you took, you're still liable. You are strictly liable when owning some animals like this. There are other things you can potentially be strictly liable for. Only one state has taken this strict liability approach, my um, childhood home state of Oklahoma. This was in the 1950s, and a farmer sprayed 2,4-D on, you know, on the farm that killed the neighbor's crop. He was controlling grass at the time, and it ended up drifting and killing the neighbor's cro co cotton crop or portions of the cotton crop. In that case, the court found the landowner used 2,4-D at their own parable and could be liable for the damages to the neighbor. This is the only case that's ever applied this. Oklahoma has, from what I have seen and my review of cases, has not applied this doctrine in, you know, 50 years since, um, or 60 years since it was first decided. So what helped play in this? Well, cotton's a 2,4-D sensitive crop. What if you're next door to another crop that's sensitive to 2,4-D or another pesticide that also has crops that are potentially very sensitive to it that drifts easy. 2,4-D drifts easy. It volatilizes just like dicamba does. Um, I'm not a weed scientist, so I'm not going to get into that. But these are things that can happen. Would another state adopt this? We have it on the books. We're having issues with these crops that drift and cause this. Would another state adopt this? We don't know at this time. Might the cases get new life with the releasing of 2,4-D resistant crops? If we continue to see dicamba damage, I don't know on that. The case is out there. It's on the books. You know, it could potentially cause problems down the road. Another state might be willing to adopt that. If we continue to see damage in Arkansas and, you know, Missouri and Tennessee, we may see one of those state courts adopt that rule. If you see, it's actually, you know, it actually provides relief if you have injury and we don't know what's going to happen so the final area i want to talk about is not anything related to this idea of negligence it's just simple it's violating regulations not following the label um, we're going to use one case to highlight this and then i'm going to talk about drift liability or what to do if you're hit with drift so applying according to the label we had a commercial applicator who had been investigated numerous times by State Department of Ag, in this case, Louisiana. Um, while being investigated on one occasion, applicator um, sprayed state ag official who was photographing him from the roadway. 
Um, I usually ask for a show of hands, but you can already see the slide. How many people, you know, think, you know, an ag official or human is usually a, an apply an approved use on a pesticide label? Um, that is not. It never is. So they found he was being, you know, he was inconsistent with the label. Before I go on to what you should do if you're experiencing drift, I need to point out the other reason with this case why this is important. And I don't want to flip back to my dicamba um, my negligence slide to show, you know, the defendant owed a duty of care. That slide, if you go back and I, I provided Shannon with um, um, a PDF copy of my slides, but if you go back and look at that slide, it was early on where I talked about the duty, you know, the elements of negligence. If you look at those elements, the first element is you have to show that the defendant was, you know, the, 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 plaint the defendant owed a duty of care to the plaintiff. The person who did the injury owed a duty of care to the plaintiff or the injured party. The reason we care about applying according to the label is there is another theory of negligence out there. It's called negligence per se. The idea behind negligence per se is I may not always be able to show easily that you owed me a duty of care in all situations. But if there's a statute on point to where I can show it establishes a duty of care or a law in place that establishes a duty of care or can be substituted for that duty of care is a better way to say that, that's a way I can then you know, show that you at least owe a duty of care if you're the applicator. If I can potentially show you violated the label and I got injured because of it, I potentially am on my way to being able to prove negligence. Violating the label is potentially the biggest problem you're going to get into because we no longer care at that point if I flip back here. Go back to my element, what I found here. I no longer care who the only witness was. I can show you violated the label. I no longer care about witnesses to the drift we are now able to show you violated the label. This is potentially going to make it easier to prove negligence in these cases. So it's really important that you do this when you're applying it. You follow the label. The label's probably the biggest thing that will protect you in these cases. There have been no cases demonstrating what I'm saying currently, but my thought is the way the courts would turn on this is if I can show you didn't follow the label, it's going to be a lot easier for me if I'm the plaintiff's attorney in this to demonstrate that you should be liable for those damages. So that's why negligence is really going to play big into this. And I swore I wouldn't go back. So what if you experience drift damage? Well, and we're putting this in the context of dicamba but with all pesticides you really need to follow the label you really need to comply with state law you really need to keep strong records of the application you really need to make sure you have general liability insurance coverage that still covers you for pesticide drift you need to make sure it's not excluded in the policy and you need to take the proper precautions you don't need to take extra precautions dicamba you probably do need to take extra precautions other pesticides you just need to make sure you're following the label and taking the appropriate precautions why do i bring up general liability insurance we've seen this in other states especially with commercial applicators they're starting to have dicamba applications excluded from their general liability insurance and they're not spraying dicamba anymore Insurance companies are recognizing this is a huge problem and a potentially huge area where they could be on the hook for a lot of damage if someone is found to be negligent or be on the hook for, the, or, you know, to be found in some way the cause of this damage. So they're starting to exclude this. That was seen more, I think, in the South over the past couple of years after this issue arose. Um, we probably haven't seen it that much in the Maryland, Delaware, and Virginia areas, but you do need to be aware of that. And you do need to pay attention that if your insurance coverage does change, you can go out there and potentially look at, do I need to buy a rider on this thing to get additional coverage?
what do you do if you're hit by drift damage? Well, the first thing is confirm the damage. Go out, make sure you were hit, make sure it wasn't something else, and we're going to talk about what you need to do to do that. One of those things will be number three, call your state department of ag. Make sure that someone is there is aware to do this, that knows that can be start, you know, following the process to verify what happened and, you know, follow up with applicators to make sure they're following the rules. Take pictures. Take pictures over time to show the damage as it's happening. You know, if it's, you know, drifting a little bit and it's, you know, it, it's knocked it back a little bit, you know, has it killed it totally, has it stunted its growth a lot to where your, you know, yields are going to be lower in those areas, what exactly has it done? Develop a record so we kind of know what happened. Make sure when you call the State Department of Ag, tests are scheduled through them. You may want to start looking around to see who saw what happened. You know, yes, you know the state's going to do this as well. You're all going to be trying to figure out who are the witnesses to this. Um, we've Kelly and I have gotten the opportunity. I don't really think it's an opportunity. We've gotten you know the ability um, by doing this type of work. Um, people will end up calling and wanting us to look at drift damage, which we really can't do much about. Other you know. Other than go out and look at it, we really can't make any, you know, claims or tell you one way or the other what's happened um, um, just based on university rules. But one we went out on, you know, there the witnesses were it was on a commercial piece. It was on commercial. It was on a residential piece of property and the people had cameras up. So it's very easy to see the drift damage take place. You know, if you're not always going to have that, so you're going to have to go out and figure out who saw this, who didn't see it, what are they, you know, who, who can help you verify who the applicator was. As I said, number six is determine who the applicator is. Witnesses are going to help you with that. Um, the state may be able to help you with that by being able to get a hold of some of these applicator records and figure that out. As it goes along, like I said. You're going to want to calculate and record the damages that you see. You know, if it just stunts it a little bit and it grows back, you may not have to worry so much. But if it knocks it out totally, you really are going to have to think about and start figuring out. And you're going to have to find experts who can tell, you know, how much you lost. You're going to have to keep good records because at the end, when you harvest the crop, we're going to need to see what, you know, what an average yield, yield was like on your farm and how has this impacted that average yield from what you would normally get from year to year. Um, if you can, try to work out a solution with the applicator. Um, you know, start negotiating um, if they're reasonable. Um, Maryland Department of Ag, for those in Maryland, um, does offer ag mediation services. Um, where they may be able to help you sit down and mediate. Both parties have to be willing to go into that mediation. Um, if not, you may have to start looking at, do I talking to an attorney? And I would say during all this at some point early on as well, you know, even up at number three, when you make phone calls to the State Department of Act, start asking around for an attorney who may be able to handle this and recognize that, you know, if you're um, – you know, your town may have an attorney who can do estates and trusts and, you know, do contracts and stuff like that, simple stuff. This is going to be a little more complicated. You may have to call around and try and find an attorney who has the right, you know, experts who can help you with this as well and help determine the record. But that's something you need to think about if that's the solution you want to go down. Um, hopefully you can work out a solution with the applicator. Outside of court, it'll be a faster way to do it. We put crop insurance up here because there were some questions at the very start when we started looking at this, at least by producers in the state. Well, if I'm hit, do I get? Can I get crop insurance? No. If my crop, if you crop ins, you have crop insurance coverage. Crop insurance coverage does not typically cover pesticide drift. Pesticide drift is not considered um, a covered loss. Um, it's typically considered a man-made loss where you're not going to receive it, even if it's not your fault. You're not going to receive crop insurance coverage for it. Um, crop insurance is now allowed, RMA, the agency within um, USDA, um, is, has worked up processes and I need to look those up. I'm still not entirely clear what they are, but you are allowed to exclude some of the yield damage from your APH. But my understanding is it's an all or nothing thing. So if you're going to exclude it, you have to exclude everything from that year on that farm and you don't get to include 
parts of it. You have to exclude all of it. You don't, even if it's a good year, you don't, on part of it, you don't get to include that yield. Um, for those that want to know, um, I put together, um, I believe this was back in early 2016 before this was even an issue and before it was even in the news. So there'll be no talk of dicamba in this, um, you know, what would happen in a pesticide drift case. It was just one of these pure dumb luck things that we actually put information out ahead of um, the actual need for it, but it's been nice to have it out there. Um, you can find it online. If you just type in go.umd.edu slash pesticide drift, um, you don't even have to capitalize the letters like I did. It will take you directly to the library's website, and you just have to click on the spot where it says download PDF or something to the left, and you can download it there. Um, but it covers a lot more cases than I did here, and also covers some of the organic issues that I didn't cover. Um, there have been cases that have looked at the fact of what happens if a pesticide that's unapproved for organics drips onto my property. Um, so far, I know of one case where this has happened. And in that case, the court said, you know, th it fell back to no negligence, mainly because the person telling the, the organic um, farmer that they needed to pull their land out of production was not the State Department of Ag, but the certifier. I have issues with that case because I don't think the um, um, court understood what um, an organic certifier does, and they are typically considered, you know, for all ex a lot of purposes. This is the state telling you they're typically, you know, have gone through a process with the state to be able to do this. They may be independent, but potentially the same as the state telling you so there were some issues there there were also other issues that the organ that it the drift did not violate any of the organic standards up to that point now it, it took a lot more it we don't have one where it's been a lot yet so it'll be kind of curious to see what happens when we do reach that point i mean I'm, i don't wish it upon anybody but i am kind of curious as to how courts will handle that issue when it does get up like I said, um, I apologize for not being able to do this. Um, when I agreed to do this, we didn't realize that this would be the same time as the Extension Risk Management Education Conference in Milwaukee. So um, instead of me trying to do this in a hotel where the Wi-Fi may have not been that good, and Shannon's also at the conference, and she may have not been able to join in as well, and it, we may have just had huge technical difficulties based on how good hotel Wi-Fi is sometimes, um, and trying to get present this to you so i'm very thankful they let me record it ahead of time and like i said if you have questions you can email me at lgoering -E at umd.edu um, you can give me a call um, you can leave me a voicemail it'll get emailed to me while i'm out of the office i will listen to it at some point um, i will hopefully get back with you if you're on twitter you could probably tweet me and i might respond this week but i will get back with you at some point um, again if you missed any of the links earlier um, that's where all my stuff is. I'm a part of numerous projects on this campus. Um, so please, um, take a moment and look at each one of those and hopefully we have information up there that will help you. Um, thank you again for listening and I will sign off now.